All right, welcome to Engineering Weekly. Um, excited that everyone's joining us this morning. We have a little bit of a reduced team, some people out on vacation, which is great. I'm Phil Sasser. I'm the co-founder and CTO of Market Protocol. I uh, just posted the uh, agenda for this call in the chat, so feel free to take a look at that. Um, and Robert, although on vacation, still made sure to make sure to let us know that it's National Tell a Joke Day. So you can see that wonderful picture that he posted of himself in the agenda there. <laughs> um, but I was actually recently, I was going to tell a story that I'm sure the devs will find funny, which is I'm on this list um, of other CTOs in the Boulder, Denver area. And they talk about um, products that are out there and what they're seeing kind of in the ecosystem and development in general. And someone came across a product that was meant for non-technical founders to measure the productivity of their development team, which they couldn't really analyze because they weren't technical. And so it did three things. It, it looked at number of lines of code, number of commits to GitHub, and number of posts to Slack as a way of analyzing a development team's success, uh, which I found pretty hysterical. So. This uh, it just reminded me of this really, really old Dilbert cartoon, which I'll also post in the chat. Um, basically just has, has them paying for, for lines of, uh, or for bugs and kind of just poking fun at that. So that's today's little comic strip joke. Uh, and the other thing that's pretty awesome, I was at Boulder Blockchain last night and everyone is talking about FOMO 3D, which I don't know if you guys have seen yet, but it's pretty incredibly interesting to look at in terms of game theory and greed and how uh, people view this stuff. It's basically like a take on a dollar auction where if an auctioneer was to hold up a dollar and say the first bid's five cents and the rules of the auction is every, if you bid the most, you get the dollar. And the second person who bid the highest ha loses all of their, their money. So I bid five cents, S4 bids 10 cents, I lose five cents. It's rational for me to then bid 15 cents. Eventually you get up to a dollar and because I'm going to lose 95 cents because S4 bid a dollar, I'm gonna bid a dollar oh five for a dollar because I only wanna lose now five cents instead of 95 cents. And this keeps going to infinity. And the only winner in the game is actually the auctioneer or the house. Um, but it's interesting how all of these rational, single atomic decisions lead to this very irrational behavior, uh, which is kind of what's going on with FOMO 3D. So anyways, interesting to take a look at that. Um, there's a link and I'll post that too. Um, all right, so do we want to go around and just introduce uh, all of the core team and everyone on the call? Uh, Aswar, do you want to just start by introducing yourself? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, this, I'm Ishwar. So I'm like working remotely uh, for like market protocols in four months. So I, I kind of handle like mostly code reviews and like uh, merging PRs and releases. Thanks everyone for joining the call. Awesome. Uh, Dan, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, Dan here. I've been working uh, about part-time on market protocol, uh, working on the service listener, which I'll be demoing later today. It's designed to take events from the contracts and uh, make sure that the API is up to date with uh, the most recent information. Awesome. Gavin, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, hi. Yeah, I, I'm Gavin. I'm just helping out with Market Protocol with uh, some of the marketing stuff and also with uh, some of the planning in terms of uh, structuring of the, uh, of the pricing. So, yeah. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today, Gavin. It's been a while since I've talked to you. Glad you're here. Yeah. <laughs> Hope to meet you soon, too. Uh, Lazar, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, 
Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lazar. I'm a community manager for Market Protocol. Um, I've been uh, recently joining all of these calls since I enjoy, like the rest of our community, all the demos that are presented by our dev team. And I look forward to uh, actually seeing what uh, service listener is because I never fully understood um, that feature. And uh, yeah, I'm glad that Dan will be able to show it to us today. Awesome. Uh, Nitin, do you want to introduce yourself? Hey, um, I'm Nitin. Uh, I am a product designer and a front-end developer at Market Protocol. And uh, yeah, so currently I've been working on the similar exchange design. So that's kind of uh, presentable now. Uh, so probably working, I'll be working on the implementation of it front-end wise. Yeah, that's it. Cool. Uh, perfect. Hi, um, perfect. I'm a contributor to Market Protocol. I've been well recently. I've been working majorly on the Market JS library to um, implement features and um, yeah, basically features and restructure the library to make it easier to use. Awesome. And then uh, there's Spartan, which I'm not sure who's behind the Spartan tag, but you want to introduce yourself also? Yeah, Phil, it's Casper behind the mask. <laughs> nice. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, Glad to be here. Go ahead, Casper, please introduce yourself. I was going to say, we're, I think, uh, familiar with most of the names on, on this call, been on a, on a number of calls before, but we're, you know, uh, Gavin and I are colleagues and we're working with. Um, advising um, uh, market uh, on your role transaction. Awesome. Cool, so thanks to everyone for, for being here. Um, yeah, so Robert and uh, Travis are both on vacation, enjoying some downtime, which is good. Um, so it's a little bit smaller call today. And then I know it's also back to school for uh, everyone in the Denver Boulder area. So some of the other folks that are normally join are, are busy with getting their kids to the first day of school. Um, so I just want to go through a little bit of what we've been working on this week. Uh, it's been a little bit reduced in terms of uh, milestone planning just because of a lot of uh, Indian holiday that was yesterday and then also people out of the office. Um, but mainly it's been uh, trying to integrate some of the big features that Perfect's gotten to us through the PRs uh, in market.js. He's gonna go through the order state watcher later on this call. Um, but that's a really great feature that'll help us with order book management and pruning of the order book based on events in the blockchain. So I'll let him talk more about that later. Um, there's been work that's ongoing with market.js to have some of the documentation be deployed per release. So as we have more people working on top of market.js, they can go back and see documentation based on the version they're working on. Um, as that becomes further along in its maturity, probably we won't have release cycles as quickly as we are right now, where typically we're probably putting out a release every week. So eventually that'll be much more helpful and useful as the documentation does change quite a bit uh, per release there. The, there's also been a lot of refinement of the UI for the SIM exchange. Um, Nit and I have gone through and, and with Ari's help, kind of revised the, the main screen there a little bit. Um, and maybe I'll just have Nitin show that briefly. I know on the last call we did demo it, but um, maybe we'll just show some of the updates there. So that's really what's been going on so far this week. Um, there's some stats posted in the agenda uh, with just kind of contributors, uh, commits, releases, forks. So I'll let you guys take a look at that. Um, and then some of the big commits this week, I mentioned of perfect helping us there. Um, obviously, Dan got the service listener all taken care of. He's also gonna demo that later in this call. And then there's been a few other uh, changes here and there to some website issues that were ongoing. Uh, 
All right, so we tried to revert, reserve a time in this call uh, for a little bit of a heads up with things that we know are going to be issues or blockers for developers that are contributors or core team. Does anyone have anything they want to talk about in regards to that? I have a few, but I'll uh, hold off until other people have a chance. All right, well, there's two that I know about that will be uh, issues once we release a new version of market.js is um, if you look in the agenda, market.js pull request number 133 and 132. Uh, we've done some refactoring in regards to how you would get contract metadata. So instead of having individual getters for each um, specific property of a contract, now there is a single get contract metadata function that would return to uh, just an object that has all of the needed metadata in a single place. So the, the one-off getter functions because of that have been removed to simplify the API. So um, eventually that will make its way up to needing to be integrated into places uh, both in the D app and then also um, in the market API that Robert was working on. And then there's also been some refactoring to avoid some confusion with collateral and it being deposited to uh, the collateral pool contract and what that's called. So there's a user's balance, which is essentially their balance of an ERC-20 token. Um, there, it, and then there's the amount that's been deposited into the collateral pool contract that is available for them to trade with. And then there is the amount that essentially from that has been locked into the smart contract based on them opening a position. And so we've done some work um, to clarify a little bit each of those names to help people distinguish between those three balances. Uh, so if you take a, take a look at market.js, there's a pull request 132 in there that's been merged that uh, took care of that refactor. And then we're going to do the same thing in the market protocol with solidity contracts as well. Is there any questions about that stuff or other comments? All right, one other thing that keeps coming up is mismatched between the ABIs or the truffle artifacts being used and the deployed contracts. So if there's any version mismatch, it's really hard to distinguish that and you'll get these innocuous errors um, that are really subtle to debug. So I think Perfect actually picked up an issue to um, compare the ABI in the truffle artifact to the deployed bytecode of the address to make sure that we're using the same versions. And so when you instantiate market.js, if there's a mismatch, then an error would be thrown. We have some questions about how we're gonna do that with the constructor um, and it being async, but in general, that's the idea of what we're trying to achieve there. Perfect, do you have any comments on that? Um, well, you've, you've said most of the comments. Um, yeah, you said most of the comments. Uh, and uh, okay, so from looking at the eat to, uh, because, the address, uh, I think MarketJS allows you to specify your own address um, or let it be fetched. So I don't know if there is a way we can also use that. I'm still, um, I'm still looking into it. So uh, yeah, not, nothing new yet. <laughs> Great. All right. Um... So that's really it for kind of the, the heads up for this week of things that I can see coming down the pipe that are going to be uh, maybe pain points for the developers. So just keep an eye out for that stuff. Um, all right. So we had both Nitin and Eswar attend uh, ETH India this past week and just wanted to give them some time to talk about their experience there, what they built in the hackathon and just kind of general synopsis of the event.
Nathan, you want to go ahead? Uh, sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. So uh, uh, last week, me and Ishwar kind of attended um, uh, ETH India, which was held at Bangalore. Um, and it was uh, kind of a three day event. First day was uh, with the tech talks and uh, like workshops and etc. There were like a bunch of companies, which uh, crypto companies, which had come. A few were uh, Dharma Protocol, um, Status, and a uh, bunch of other companies. And then the next, uh, over the weekend, the Saturday and Sunday were the hackathons, where uh, me and Ish were kind of uh, participated in it. So we thought we could uh, try something out, like uh, hack something out of it. And uh, we kind of wanted to use MarketJS to uh, do something, build out of it, something. But we couldn't get a proper idea or what to build on it. But uh, yeah, we kind of end up, ended up uh, building um, a simple dApp um, uh, called as ETH Survey. So basically, it's a decentralized survey uh, dApp. And uh, what exactly the dApp does is basically you can build survey forms and uh, you can create a short URL. and um, can share that short URL and once the and another user takes up the short URL, he gets a certain incentives. So while building the survey, uh, while uh, basically what you'll be doing is you'll be deploying a contract, uh, you'll be making a transaction and you have to kind of find a certain amount to it. And uh, you can set the number of limit of how many people you can uh, choose to take the survey. For example, if you find the survey uh, for one ether and like uh, allow 100 uh, users to take the survey, the one ether will be split across the 100 uh, people who take the survey. So it's like a win-win situation for both the parties. Like people who create the survey will get genuine uh, results and people who take the survey will get certain incentives. So yeah, it's, it's like a simple D app and uh, so we just hacked that over a couple of days. That's it. Cool. Thanks for uh, telling us about that. I'm, I'm glad you guys got the opportunity to go. Uh, Denver was such a cool event. So it's awesome that they're extending those everywhere. Yeah. I wonder, I, I wonder if Crypto Mental is going to be at ETH Berlin um, since he lives there. <laughs> I, know, I know a bunch of people from kind of the area are going. Uh, it sounds like it's going to be pretty awesome as well. Yeah. Um, Nitin, while you have the floor, do you want to just show us the updated UI? Um, or do you need a second to prepare that? Yeah, I can, I can show that. Awesome. Just one second. I'll just share my screen. So do you want me to share the uh, uh, some exchange? Uh, I'm not able to hear you, Phil. That's because I'm muted. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I was just saying uh, just briefly to show the updates that we did, maybe. Um, I last week, so it doesn't need to be super in depth, but it's kind of finalized at this point. Yeah, got it. Uh, so yeah, uh, I mean, I'll just quickly show you the last uh, week's uh, designs which we had. I, I hope most of you had got a chance to look at this. And so this week, uh, based on Phil's feedback, uh, kind of refined it and modified a bit. And uh, yeah, I mean, it, it just like a minor refinement here and there, adding a bunch of icons uh, here and there. And uh, yeah, <laughs> also we kind of modified the layout a bit. So before for the same exchange, we kind of decide use like a three column layout. And uh, uh, right now we kind of split into four different columns over here, giving more um, room for the order book and trade history. Because I, I believe that's what people gonna majorly gonna see that and scroll across the data. So that's like giving a separate space for that would make sense over there. And, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, this is a bit, this is the UI update, which was there on same exchange part. The other 
UI update was regarding the uh, the MetaMask flow, MetaMask connectivity flow. So right now in our D app, we have uh, kind of a modal popping up showing that uh, you've connected to the MetaMask or you are you are not connected to MetaMask. So I just want to kind of want to red, get, get rid of that because uh, that'll be too uh, bad of an experience is what I thought. So instead we would be having a, a tiny little uh, icon over there on the top. Uh, just like this. So these are the three states of connectivity, MetaMask connectivity you're thinking of. One is like connected and it's kind of locked state and disconnected, something like that. And uh, you can click on that and make some actions over there. So this is the part of um, the MetaMask connection UI. And uh, yeah, apart from that, it's pretty much pretty much from my side. Is there any anything which you guys want to talk or give some feedback, share some thoughts. I've noticed that on this new proposed design, which I like a lot since it's a four column kind of like uh, display, which I think is mm, very clean. You've decided mm -hmm. to go with, uh, with the wall on the left side. Is that, are you gonna be doing the right side version as well or how does that thing work? You remember yeah. that we discussion recently, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. So the thing is it, it can be interchangeable, but uh, one thing I noticed is kind of this left and right side orientation is based on the region. So if you can, I think most of the Asian regions are having it in the right side and most of the uh, uh, US region is kind of having it in the left side and Phil also suggested no, uh, the left side seems more uh, <laughs> coherent to him. So yeah. Okay. I feel bad for UI developers and UX developers because there's so much feedback from so many different thoughts and opinions. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, my feedback was just that the places that I trade on typically have it on the left, and that for whatever reason seems comfortable to me, but you know, eventually these things will be hopefully draggable. So we could have allow people to save their layout uh, in the way that they want to view it. So each of these modules could be uh, just that, you know, very modular in terms of how they're laid out. But I think, I think it looks great and I think it's awesome. Thanks, Phil. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Cool. All right. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the next... Uh, demo that we had, I believe, uh, Dan, do you want to talk about the service listener and walk us through a little bit about the functionality there? Certainly, certainly. And my uh, computer just went into what Travis refers to as uh, jet takeoff mode. So hopefully it's not too loud there in the background. Uh, we've had quite a few moments where my voice has been drowned out by the Apple fan. Um, let me get my uh, everything sharing here. Okay, so as with, can you all see my screen now? Yep, yes. great. Um, so as with uh, just about everything here, the uh, uh, service listener starts with the D app, and the, the goal of the service listener is to um, hear uh, when the, um, so not fully prepared here, um, the goal of the service listener is to hear when there is an update to the um, to one of the contracts or new contract is created, and then the uh, uh, um, API gets that update in the background. So um, you can see uh, in Postman here that right at the moment we have eleven uh, API records on the contracts endpoint. Um, we're using the Dev API. And so what I'm gonna do is uh, start up the, um, the service listener and I'll show you kind of how that uh, links in and then I can show you the code real briefly. So um, the service listener can be started uh, local truffle environment with just an NPM start or uh, with a provider environment variable that tells you where to connect. So I'm connecting to the Rinkby node that Robert set up for us to develop on here. And um, once you uh, go ahead and connect, there is a, actually a daemon uh, command as well uh, to start this in the background. 
but you'll see here that what it does is subscribe to each of the uh, APIs and uh, then runs through and sets up several event listeners to uh, notice when uh, different things happen to the contracts. So if I go back over to the, the app here and create a uh, new contract, which I'm going to do um, on uh, extremely fast mode, so hopefully we'll get it nice and quick. Uh, oh, confirm MetaMask. So our contract is deploying there. Um, and uh, you'll see as soon as it uh, completes that deploy, there we go. There's a whole bunch of uh, information here. Now, uh, this log is not quite as verbose when you're in uh, not in development mode. There is some, uh, uh, you know, additional debug logging that comes out, all this kind of the data there. Um, particularly, you know, we don't need to be outputting the, uh, the exact function in our production logs. But uh, what happens is it notices an event that it's listening for. And we can see what event that was right here. It prints out the event information and it goes down and kind of normalizes that for the API. It uses the uh, uh, get contract metadata function that Phil was talking about earlier um, and uh, then posts that up to the API. So if I go ahead and uh, refresh this here, we'll see we now have a new contract, contract number 12 uh, in here. And uh, that will uh, go ahead and update this record if we have any information coming back. And so right at the moment, there's a number of update hooks. Um, these are the different events that we listen to. And uh, there's update hooks and then removal hooks and uh, delete hook. And uh, one thing I, I do want to note is that there's this uh, attribute called is whitelisted uh, that goes into the API. And if that is true, then the uh, contract is considered to be active in the API, and if it's false, then it's considered to be soft deleted. And there was a little bit of back and forth with Travis last week about putting that into that get contract metadata um, uh, function, and we ultimately decided not to uh, because it seemed like it was going to be very, very difficult and uh, intensive to add it right there. Um, and it's really kind of a contextual um, attribute here for us uh, soft delete. Have we, have we fired this removed event? Um, so in the code, what's uh, happening, uh, thank you all for encouraging me to learn TypeScript for the first time. I'm enjoying it uh, sort of and not enjoying it in other ways, but uh, <laughs> it was good to know at least. Um, so I got, uh, got this all TypeScript, uh, TypeScripted up here. And so eventually, you know, essentially what's happening is there's a wrapper around MarketJS um, called Market Interface, which just kind of handles, uh, uh, you know, making that a little bit cleaner for the application itself um, and uh, spawning up the uh, MarketJS instance at as the endpoint uh, for Web3 changes or is interacted with. And then uh, these uh, listeners get applied. Um, you can see these uh, are created. There's actually a generator that uh, creates the listener with the MarketJS instance and then goes ahead and uh, uh, you know, handles all that output. And here's where all that stuff was happening, that, that debug. So it's pretty simple. Um, if we wanted to add more, uh, Listeners here, we could uh, simply hook into any events that get added to the contracts. And in honor of National Joke Day, uh, we did have uh, that ABI uh, version conflict thing come up as Travis was trying to test. And uh, so he's saying, I'm not getting any events. And I'm saying, well, uh, all of my tests are passing. So uh, there must be something else wrong in the network. Um, and, uh, and this is a shout out to I Am De Developer, uh, which is an absolutely amazing Twitter account. Uh, if you guys uh, are on Twitter and want to follow some, some great jokes, uh, this guy is hilarious. Um, so that's about it. I don't, uh, any, any questions along with that?
for uh, the sake of the fact that we're going to write um, a monthly dev update pretty soon, um, how would you describe uh, this feature to uh, somebody who's a non-developer? Like, what does a, se a service listener is used for and like, what's its main utility and value proposition, so to speak? Sure. Um, the service listener is designed to essentially provide a uh, centralized cache of what's going on in the contract ecosystem. So you could certainly go out to the Rinkeby node or the, or the main node uh, whenever you wanted to and ask for all this information using MarketJS and, you know, get the metadata and kind of pull that in live. But uh, that is going to require that you're connected the node that your node is running is much more complicated architecture. So if you're running a reporting service or you're running uh, the, the D app and you want to be returning a lot of information about a lot of contracts very, very quickly, uh, you're going to want to uh, cache that information somewhere. And that's where uh, I know we're all working in Web3 land, but Web2 is really good at that type of stuff. So that's, uh, that's what happens there. And that's why service listening. Great, thanks. Certainly. So just to give you like the, the exact pain point that caused us to go down this path is that uh, previously when we had a lot of contracts in the whitelist, it would take a very long time for that Explorer view in the D app to load, um, like almost minutes. And so now with the service listener, instead of hitting the, the whitelist contract and iterating through all those and generating this explorer on everyone's local machine, we're doing that as they're being whitelisted and saving in a database. So it'd be a much nicer user experience to load that up um, using the service listener and then a uh, database that has that information stored in a centralized fashion, but you can still go ahead and verify if need be that that's coming directly from the blockchain. Um, but it does provide a much better UX. Yeah, and kind of standard disclaimer on the back of that is uh, the API is not the canonical source. The blockchain is a canonical source. So you would never want to use this for um, anything that's that's critical or, or any decision that you can make on a specific contract. You would only want to use it for list views and, and things of that nature that, uh, you know, the impact of out-of-date information is not going to be quite as large. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, I know the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I forget who it was, but someone was talking about looking at the pricing um, mechanisms and things like that. And, and one thing I did notice as I was developing on this uh, is when the uh, GUI price was up at 61 last week uh, during all the, the market shenanigans and I went to deploy a contract at fast speed, it was costing somewhere in the neighborhood of $250 to uh, do that. So that might be something that we want to, <laughs> we want to look at a little bit further as well. Um, and something I just wanted to know. So that is, uh, that's it for my demo, unless anyone has any other questions. Great. Thanks, thanks a lot for that. Uh, I really appreciate it. It's really great to go, go through it. Um, and there's, there's a few, we just really focused on bringing that down, but there's a few possible scenarios to, to bring the, those prices for deployment down uh, considerably. Excellent, you're welcome. Awesome. All right, thanks a lot, Dan. And then, uh, perfect, do you wanna go over the order state watch here? Yeah, sure. Uh, okay, let me, yeah, let me just. Um, okay, I think my screen is visible, right? Okay, hello. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can, and we can see you. Okay. <laughs> Um, is my screen visible too? I just need to be sure. Yes. Okay. So, um, okay. So, uh, the, yeah, we're talking about the other state watcher. Um, the, basically the other state watcher is to allow the users of the, um, of the market JS library to be able to, to keep track of if their orders are valid or not. 
Um, so basically, the other states is, um, I think, a composite type of if the state is valid or not. Um, so you, you get to check um, if it's valid. If it's valid, so if it's valid, um, we we'll return some relevant information about um, collateral, um, collateral, the maker's collateral balance, the fees, and um, everything. I will explain how those are gotten. So, so the the the, the um, other state watcher exposes four four functions. One that allows you to subscribe. Basically, just subscribe. We call back to get updates on events. You can unsubscribe. Then you can also add. So then a function to add orders. So we validate to ensure that the order is correct. And then add it to our list of orders that we are watching for. So the, sus the subscribe function uses two classes to actually get events. Um, uses two other watchers. So we have the, um, sorry. Okay, yeah, we have the, let's find the watcher here. We have the um, expiration watcher, um, which checks, checks the, checks this interval, checks at intervals to ensure that um, the, yeah, to ensure that the, the order hasn't expired. And then we also have the event watcher, which I also which also checks for basically all events, checks for events that are currently being broadcasted in the blockchain that are currently being emitted on blockchain. So, um, so yes. So what back to the other state watcher? So basically, we just subscribe to the event watcher and subscribe to the um, to the expiration watcher. So whenever an event is broadcasted right so because we we are basically after this switch, um, after the state of an order to know if it's um, valid or not so there are some specific events that we are actually watching for so the first one is if we get a token approval event right if it if a token were to be approved then it means it could mean one or two things it could mean that it's well a lot of things actually, but basically we're only interested to we're only interested to know if the maker if the maker um, if the maker still has um, if the maker has enough allowance if the maker or taker or whoever changed an approval for an event has enough allowance for collateral or for fees and things like that. So what we do is we um, we basically delete we delete the so we have a cache because. We don't, when computing all the states, we don't want to repeat, we don't want to repeat, um, we don't want to repeat recomputing state that hasn't changed. So if we get an approval, a change, an event of an approval change, we delete the allowance for that particular token or, um, for the owner and the spender. So the collateral balance allowance store is basically a lazy store that whenever, whenever it is, um, an allowance is fetched, it caches it. So next time you request for the allowance, it uses the cache. So once we do that, we, we also have a store to keep track of all um, addresses and tokens that are linked to an order. So we basically check for those. We check for those if if um, if some if there are orders that are relating to the particular owner as in the particular owner and that token that was that it's um, that its approval has changed. We fetch all those orders and then we call this emit revalidate order async. I'll get to that soon. So then for transfers, so, so if there's a transfer, similar logic, we know that someone has moved a balance somewhere. So we delete the balance of the person our cash from our cash. We delete the balance of the person making. We delete the balance of the person that is means the money is being transferred. The token is being transferred to, and then we check for all orders relating to the person transferring the money, and then we um, we emit revalidate. Then also we look for so the um, the market token also. Uh, a market token also has its own event for when a person explicitly updates a user 
explicitly updates its locked balance. So we also, yeah, repeat the same thing, delete the cache from the collateral and balance allowance store. Then now, so whenever, um, whenever a, an order is being traded on the market contract, we get, um, it emits some events. If it's being traded or being canceled, some events are being, we have the other field events and the other canceled events that's been, um, that's been broadcasted. So we, we, check, we check the ash of the order that's been, that been broadcasted um, and we delete. So we also have a store, also a lazy store for keeping track of field and canceled orders. So what we do is we clear the cache for the field and canceled order for that address and for that contract and the hash, then we emit revalidate. Same thing for canceled, we clear it and we emit revalidate. Um, then also we check for the um, collateral pool. If, uh, if, 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 um, if the amounts allocated or unallocated, if the amount deposited in, the, in your collateral pool changes, we also, basically check and update. And of course, I mean, you, we need to ensure that you have enough um, collateral for you to fill a particular order. If not, uh, if not, then we, we know that the order is, is no more, should not be valid anymore. So now this is the emit revalidate order aid sync that all those guys, all those um, cases call to revalidate the states of all those orders. Right. So what this uses is also a utility class called the um, the other state util. So the function of the other state util is quite simple. You when you call other state util, it fetches all the relevant states. Now because so basically this computes all those relevant states that I showed you earlier, the um, the amount of collateral needed and everything. Uh, so because now, because we use a lot of lazy stores, it means that if we don't delete, if we hadn't deleted the value at, in the store at a particular time, it means that it just fetches from the cache and doesn't need to go and refetch again from the, um, from the blockchain. So, so that's why here to get um, the collateral pool address, we all use our lazy stores um, for needed market, um, to get the collateral needed. So yes, yeah, so this should also be cached, but I think still part of it, still part of, um, still being deliberated on a better way because you might not need to always make that request. But anyways, so this is going to get the amount of collateral needed for this, for the particular order that we are currently checking. Um, compute the hash, we try to get the maker's collateral balance, that is for a particular order to know to know how much collateral the maker currently has. Um, then also to ensure that, I mean, the fees for the, um, to ensure the maker for the, maker for the collateral has enough fees to pay for the order. Sorry, the maker, the maker of the order has enough fees. Um, then also fee allowance to be sure that you have enough allowance to be deposited to the fee recipients to the few recipients, then here we get the quantity. So for a particular order to know how much quantity has been filled or canceled from, for that order. And then also we, we have, uh, we calculate the remaining fillable quantity, which is basically subtracting the total quantity from the amount of quantity that has been filled or canceled for the order. And then we have this utility class too for calculating remaining fillable calculate um, for remain um, remaining fillable for makers and takers. So this basically checks this basically checks to ensure that the uh, the um, how much how much can a maker uh, how much can a maker for the order how much can he cancel or fill for the remaining quantity of the order, and then then for a prospective taker too so if if uh, if it's specified. Then, so once all that is gotten from the get orders relevant state, then we validate if the order is still valid. So validate if the order is still valid basically just checks to ensure that 
your millimeters balance is um, the maker's balance is is less than sorry the maker's collateral balance is less than the the relevant state needed collateral if not we emit the correct error um, if you have insufficient balance for transfer if there are no more remaining food quantities to be filled then the order is dead uh, yeah, so those are the different events, um, insufficient balance for transfer, insufficient allowance for transfer. That's if you don't have enough money for fee, to pay for the fees. Then, so um, in the other state watcher, um, so after we call the get order and it returns the other states, we then broadcast, then we then broadcast. So we, of course we check to ensure that there's actually a change, then we then broadcast the new states to the subscriber. So that's um, basically the walkthrough of how other states watch our works. Uh, let me know if you have any questions so I can further clarify. Thank you so much, perfect. Does anyone have any questions before we move on? All right, um, just want to open the floor for any general discussion. If there's anything that anyone wants to bring up or talk about um, before we conclude. Uh, also, feedback on the call is welcome. Uh, feedback on any of the development process, anything that you guys would want to talk about, this is the time. I just wanted to ask you, um, how much time do you believe is going to take us to mitigate from CMS to um, WordPress. Like I know that your idea now for all the pages that need to be um, edited by myself or somebody else uh, in the team is going to probably be done via WordPress. So how much time does that usually take? Um, I'm a little confused. We're not right at this moment. We're not considering using WordPress, right? We're going to use Netlify the same. CMS that we're using, we're just migrating it to its own repo. So you'll have the ability to release it without needing the devs team to worry about the actual website. So it's basically just decoupling the website from the blog and the CMS uh, press page and other things like that. So then you'll have full control over how quickly it gets published. Uh huh. That's cool. I, 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 then I misunderstood the thread where I read somebody mentioning that it's going to be solved via WordPress. Sorry. Got it. Yeah, we were discussing other options um, to basically the same thing to host the content. Um, and we may consider other options, but I think that this will alleviate the pain point right now, which is that you publish something and it has to be coupled with the release of the website, which is kind of just a bad experience because it doesn't give you the autonomy to do it yourself. And then it also involves us making sure that whatever is in the pipeline and the website has to be ready to be released. So, I mean, it makes it really impossible, I think, for you to get content out and it's any reasonable amount of time. So now we're gonna decouple those. So anytime you wanna post to uh, any of the CMS related pages, you'll be able to do that immediately and we won't have to worry about the actual core website being affected with the release. That's great, thanks. And it'll, I mean, we'll certainly see how the process goes and we can revise it again. I mean, it definitely is on, on my lack of understanding of how Netflix would couple those two things so closely to and how kind of I guess cumbersome that process would be. So I apologize for that design choice. Definitely was mine. No, I mean, I think it's a pretty good choice. It's just uh, that, that, that thing that, you know, it requires multiple hands. I think that the solution that you selected is the best one. I'm kind of used to using CMS anyways, and I think it's pretty friendly for the application that we want to use it for. And um, I, I believe that's going to be a good solution. The only thing that I'm not sure how it's going to look like is how do we um, do the newsletters in CMS? Like we were talking about exporting them to HTML files, right? So um, uh, do they need to be inserted into uh, CMS manually for the newsletter page or like there's a there's another solution that you uh, think would be better. I mean, we're not issuing newsletters on a daily basis or anything. So like, even if uh, 
even if it would require, I think, the uh, input of developers to uh, integrate an HTML page instead of me doing it manually in CMS, I don't think that's going to be too big of a problem. We, we're only doing like maybe two newsletters a month at this point in time. And how I think you guys do at least two web uh, website releases a month too. You should, theoretically, you should be able to handle it the same, same way. So if you had a, a .html document that was, was the newsletter uh, via the CMS, you could just upload that file. And then basically you would just create like a little preview, which is what you're doing now with the blog post, right? So it would just be like a little bit of text about what the newsletter covers. And then people would see that little preview, click on it, and it would bring them to the full HTML newsletter that you uploaded via the CMS via Netlify. So um, I don't think if, if, if you have the HTML that's already being used, I, I don't think it will involve anything from the dev team to do that. Oh, okay, great. I, I Since I never use CMS to upload any HTMLs, I, I wasn't aware that you can just simply upload a file and uh, it's going to be displayed properly. Pretty sure. I mean, you're able to upload all of the images. I think it, I think it gives you the option to just upload any generic file. Um, let me, I mean, we can, does anyone know that? So we, can, we can take a look and definitely circle back on it. Okay. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's no rush. I just wanted to make sure that that process is also uh, going to be done that way. Yeah, it definitely idea would be to not have to worry about uh, dev team dealing with those posts and again, giving you the autonomy to be able to handle it. Great. Thanks, man. Absolutely. Cool. Anything else from anyone? Thanks guys, really appreciate all the hard work. I think there's really some massive features that got knocked out with the service listener and the order state watcher. Um, pretty excited about getting those integrated into Nitten's UI and uh, all those features being rolled out across the D app. So thank you. Okay. All right, everyone have a great rest of your week and we'll talk to everyone soon. All right. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone.